afternoon, everyone. Uh, so um, thank you for joining the PHRC Women's History Program honoring human relations heroes. Uh, today's program uh, will begin with opening remarks, uh, followed by the introduction of our featured speaker, and then there will be time designated for questions and comments at the end. Uh, most of you probably uh, can tell our executive director um, is not be able to um, join us. So I will be uh, extending opening remarks on his behalf. So executive director uh, first extends his regret for not being able to attend, uh, but he wants to welcome everyone to the program and he appreciates your attendance. And today we have a great human relations Shiro that is here to drop nuggets of knowledge on the historical role of women of color and movements and communities. So sit back to take part, enjoy, and learn. That's from our ED. So now for the introduction of our featured speaker. So as I read Executive Director Clifford Boyd's bio, I was not surprised that she has been on the forefront of advancing social justice. And why? Because she is my sister in Greek. She is a member. <laughs> She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And to be a member of this powerful organization of ladies, her passion must align with the purpose of to provide public service, frontline leadership, and support in local communities throughout the world. Diane Clements Boyd was appointed executive director of the Evansville Vanderburg County Human Relations Commission in January of 2004. Diane has been in the forefront of advancing social justice in the city of Evansville for over 20 years. In addition to being responsible for enforcing municipal civil rights laws, Diane is responsible for advising several municipal boards and in 2023 led the establishment and launch of the Evansville Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. Diane serves as chairperson of the Indiana Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights, first vice president of the International Association of Official Human Rights Agency, and past president of the Indiana Consortium of State and Local Human Rights Agency. Diane is a member of the Evansville Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and is a graduate of the University of California Los Angeles with a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology. So let's give a warm welcome to our featured speaker, Executive Director Diane Clements Boyd. Well, thank you, Don, for that really kind um, opening welcome. I really appreciate that. And first, please allow me to thank uh, Director Chad Lassiter in his absence. Uh, and the staff of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Uh, LaDon Robinson, thank you again. Amanda Brothman, uh, Desiree Chang, uh, thank you all for your assistance. Uh, and I also wanna shout out and acknowledge Carrie P. Simmons, uh, my colleague on uh, the International Association of Official Human Rights Agencies. Um, so I want to thank my colleagues here at the uh, Evansville Vanderburgh County Human Relations Commission, if you're on. Uh, and I certainly I see my president uh, of the International Association of Official Human Rights Agencies, Dr. Elisa Warren. We see you. I remember. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so thank you again uh, for allowing me into this space uh, during Women's History Month. Uh, when Chad uh, asked me to do this about a year ago, I really think it was that long ago. Maybe it was just this summer, but it seems like a year ago. I, I did say yes. Um, I really didn't know uh, at the time what I would discuss, uh, but I did decide to uh, focus on women of color uh, because we are not always recognized uh, for our contributions uh, to society. Um, I submit to you that women of color struggle in society to be seen and are oftentimes judged for being their authentic selves. And we are not given credit uh, for our intellect and our brilliance on issues. So today I want to rethink the master narrative 
that we are inferior, uh, which is rooted in sexist and racist ideology, and acknowledge and celebrate how women of color have worked to improve society and the conditions that warranted change through their involvement and contributions to civil rights and social justice movements. So now I'm going to share my screen. So the title for today's Lunch and Learn is the historical role of women of color in movements and community, showing us the way. I would like to celebrate the tenacity and the courageousness of women of color in championing civil rights and social justice in this country, in addition to taking an honest look at the underbelly of these movements, if you will. So the struggle continues. So this presentation is a curated synopsis of movements highlighting how these women sought to create change through participation in campaigns, protesting, and advocacy. I want to end by discussing some of the ways that Black women led non-traditional movements in communities and how their actions and organizing efforts have been instrumental in supporting the village and the plight of marginalized communities. I'll briefly highlight the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, the feminist movement of the 70s, and lastly, more contemporary movements and campaigns, Black Lives Matters movement, Me Too movement, and Say Her Name. As I go through these slides, I think you will notice the through line that helps to explain the role of women of color, particularly Black women in history, based on the intersectional characteristics or dynamics of race, sex, and class. The women's suffrage movement is most often associated with individuals like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Lucretia Mott. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott were credited with initiating the movement after being denied an opportunity to participate in the world's anti-slavery society in 1840. Likening their status to that of enslaved people, Stanton and Mott organized the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, calling for equality of citizenship rights equal to white men. We know that Black women and other women of color were active in the women's suffrage movement. However, Black women were not entirely welcome into the movement because of racism and fear that their involvement would hurt the effort. Sojourner Truth, an outspoken abolitionist and women's right proponent, made her mark in history with her legendary speech at Akron Convention in 1851, ain't I a woman? Which was a dual testament to the burden of racism and sexism. So when women's suffrage groups planned an historic march in 1913 on Pennsylvania Avenue to coincide with Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, calling on the newly elected president to make women's suffrage a priority in his administration. Just as Sojourner Truth had been discouraged from speaking at the Akron Convention in 1851, Black women were discouraged from participating at the march. But that didn't stop Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell from successfully organizing a group of Black women to participate at the march. These women drew from their membership in Black women's clubs and connections to Black sororities to get women involved. Members of women's suffrage groups and the founders of Delta Sigma Theta sorority participated in the 1913 march. The founders of Delta Sigma Theta sorority convinced the administration at Howard University to, to allow them to participate in the march. Not only did the women arrive to an angry crowd, but black women were Jim Crow by the white suffrage leaders that demanded that they march at the back of the procession. 
Historical accounts maintain that Ida B. Wells refused, and so did the founders of Delta Sigma Theta, and took their rightful place in the march. The 19th Amendment was ratified on August the 18th, 1920, seven years after the 1913 march. But for people of color, barriers to voting persisted until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. There were other women of color in the women's suffrage movement. Mabel Ping Wali was born in Guangzhou, China in 1896. She immigrated to the U.S. on an academic scholarship at the age of nine. Starting in her teens, she became an active figure in the New York suffrage movement. In 1912, Lee, on horseback, led a suffrage parade of 10,000 people for which she was written about by both the New York Tribune and the New York Times. The same year, she entered Bernard College she joined the Chinese Students Association and wrote essays on feminism and suffrage for the Chinese Students Monthly. In May 1914, Lee wrote an essay, The Meaning of Women's Suffrage, which argued that equality for women was essential for democracy. Lee gave a 1915 speech to the Women's Political Union titled The Submerged Half advocating for girls' education and women's civic participation, particularly among the Chinese American community. Jovita Idar was born in Laredo, Texas in 1885. She was initially a teacher, but became a journalist where she felt she could encourage more social change. She was part of a family that spoke out against the educational and social discrimination that ethnic Mexicans faced in Texas. The family faced significant danger because of their activism. Jovita's brother Frederico was assassinated and her brother Clemente received death threats. Despite these challenges, the Adars continued their social justice work. In 2011, in 1911, after the brutal lynching of 14-year-old Antonio Gomez in Thorndale, Texas, her family organized a Premier Congreso Mexicanasta, a conference to discuss the multiple grievances of ethnic Mexicans. This organization is credited with launching the American Civil Rights Movement. Ovida helped create La Liga Feminal Mexicanista an organization that advocated for women's suffrage, provided food, clothing, and education for poor children, and hosted literary and theoretical productions to raise money for the community. The beginning of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s is most associated with Brown versus the Board of Education, Montgomery bus boycott, and the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. On May 17, 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court's unanimous decision declared separate but equal in the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson case as unconstitutional. The architects and legal minds were Charles Hamilton Houston, Dean of Howard Law School, and his protege and star pupil, Thurgood Marshall. However, there was a woman by the name of Pauli Murray, a formidable activist and organizer. After hearing Pauli Murray speak at a Workers' Defense League rally, the young lawyer Thurgood Marshall wrote a letter of recommendation to Howard University School of Law, where he was an alumnus. And in 1941, Murray was awarded a scholarship. She was the only woman in her law class and one professor's claim that he didn't understand why a woman would wanna to go to law school, which added more fuel to her fire. She was at the top of her class at Howard and while taking a civil rights seminar, she wrote a final thesis paper arguing that Plessy versus Ferguson should be frontally attacked by explaining that segregation violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. She made a $10 bet with her professor 
Spotswood Robinson that within 25 years, Plessy versus Ferguson would be overturned. Not only did she win that bet, but her strategy ensured the 1954 Brown v. Board win. Her law professor, Professor Robinson, provided her paper to Thurgood Marshall's team, and they used it to develop their argument against segregation as the law of the land. Chief Justice Warren, when delivering the opinion of the court, echoed Polly Murray's argument in law school. According to modern psychological knowledge, segregation has a detrimental effect on children of color. Segregated educational facilities were declared inherently unequal under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. 2024 marks the 60th anniversary of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The granddaddy, or should I say the grandmama of all civil rights laws. Last year, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. While there were many things that helped to usher in the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the March on Washington was certainly one of them. I hope many of you watched the movie on Netflix, Rustin, that provide a glimpse into the making of the March on Washington that was organized by Baird Rustin. The activists credited for the success of the March on Washington were the big six civil rights leaders that led the leading civil rights organizations during that time. John Lewis representing SNCC, Whitney Young representing the National Urban League, a. Philip Randolph, Martin Luther King Jr. representing SCLC, James Farmer representing CORE, and Roy Wilkins representing the NAACP. But countless women helped with the planning and organizing leading up to that day. But only one woman was on the program to speak at the March of Washington. Dr. Dorothy Height of the National Council of Negro Women was the only female member of the Big Six March organizers. And Anna Arnold Hegeman of the National Council of Churches served as the lone woman on the events administrative committee. When the initial program lineup was presented at the organizing committee, it included not one female speaker. It was suggested to A. Philip Randolph, you should ask female activists to stand up as he discussed the historic role of black women and then they could take a bow. Well, that didn't go over well and the women didn't find that that was enough. They acquiesced though to avoid embarrassing Randolph, but they continued to push the issue and the need to recognize the role of women in that movement. They crafted a message to the male leaders and it read, in light of the role of Negro women in the struggle for freedom and especially in light of the extra burden they have carried because of the castration of our Negro man in this culture, it is incredible that no woman should appear as a speaker at the historic March on Washington meeting at the Lincoln Memorial. Ouch, let me just say that. It was suggested that Merle Evers be allowed to speak during the program and present the other women to be honored during the tribute to Negro woman fighters for freedom and the men agreed. But due to traffic delays on the route to the airport, Merle missed her speaking slot and never made it to the stage, but instead Daisy Bates stepped in to address the crowd and the speech read as follows. Mr. Randolph, Friends, women of this community, our pledge to you, to Martin Luther King, Roy Wilkins, and all of you fighting for our civil liberties, that we will join hands with you as women of this country. Rosa Gregg, president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Dorothy Height, the National Council of Negro Women and Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, and the Methodist Church women. All the women pledge that we will join hands with you. We will kneel in, we will sit in until we can eat at any corner in the United States. We will walk until we are free 
until we can walk to any school and take our children to any school in the United States. And we will sit in and we will kneel in and we will lie in if necessary until every Negro can vote. This we pledge to the women of America. The women honored, as you can see on this image, Rosa Parks, Daisy Bates, Merle Evers, Diane Nash, Elvira Turner, widow of assassinated NAACP activist Herbert Lee, and Gloria Richardson, co-founder of the Cambridge Nonviolent Action Committee. Dr. Dorothy Hyde recalled the moment in her memoir, and it read, that moment was vital to the awakening of women's movements. Mr. Rustin's stand showed us that men honestly didn't see their position as patriarchal or patronizing. They were happy to include women in the human family, but there was no question who headed the household. <laughs> Dolores Huerta, an elementary school teacher, left her job to organize after seeing the poverty conditions of her students, whose parents were farm workers. The legendary labor leader, women's advocate, and civil rights activist who co-founded the United Farms Worker. Most, men, uh, most people are familiar with UFW President Cesar Chavez, but Dolores Huerta worked alongside Cesar Chavez to lead strikes against California grape growers in the 60s and the 70s. She was arrested 22 times for participating in nonviolent disobedience activities and strikes. In 2012, President Obama bestowed her with the prestigious Presidential Medal of Freeman, Freedom, the highest civilian award in the United States. The slogan, Si se puede, yes, it is possible, or yes, we can, was a slogan that she came up with. Hmm. Cesar Chavez was credited for the slogan, but it was Dolores Huerta that came up with that slogan. President Obama acknowledged that he borrowed it from Dolores Huerta when he gave her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Bobby Kennedy was an ally and friend to Dolores Huerta and the UFW cause, and she was on stage with Bobby Kennedy the night he was shot and killed in Los Angeles at the Ambassador Hotel. The feminist movement. So as someone who grew up in the 1970s, the image of the feminist movement was women burning their bras, but we know that it was more than that. Feminism was born out of women's response to the system of patriarchy, questioning the roles of biological sex and gender in a male-imposed social order. While the women's suffrage movement was seen as the first wave of the feminist movement by the 70s, people had started to refer to feminism as women's liberation. The National Organization of Women was the leading organization of the movement during the era. In 1966, Polly Murray, remember her from the Brown case? Alongside 48 other feminists founded the National Organization for Women. Murray had proposed the idea to Betty Friedan one of the most renowned feminist leaders of the time and author of The Feminine Mystique. Mary convinced Frieden that women should have their own activist organization to represent their needs, like how the NAACP represented Black interests. However, Mary stayed in the background writing organizational documents that represented her view of now as the NAACP for women. So Mary, what what a, a figure in history wrote the winning arguments in the Brown case. She goes on to help found now. Uh, she's a trailblazer for black women in the LGBTQ plus community. She became the first African-American woman ordained as an Episcopal priest. And you'll now find her on the 2024 U.S. quarter. So so look out for that. I just found that out. She's going to be on the on the new quarters. Uh, the feminist movement focused on liberating women from oppression, 
but the movement did not always resonate with black women and other marginalized groups. Women of color criticized the feminist movement for focusing on issues of middle-class white women. While white women activists expressed a desire to work outside the home, black feminist activists did not share that view because black women had historically been working outside the home as enslaved workers, uh, farmers, and maids. Mm. Although black women served as driving forces in the feminist movement, they remained unseen and unheard on the public stage and were not recognized for groundbreaking efforts and accomplishments. The book, With Her Fish Raised, authored by Laura L. Levitt, tells the story of Dorothy Pittman Hughes, a trailblazing black feminist that traveled the country with Gloria Steinem and made children, race, and welfare rights central to the women's movement. While many of us remember that photo and likely do remember Gloria Steinem, we may not know the work of Dorothy Pittman Hughes. The book discusses how Dorothy Pittman came to the women's liberation movement through her experiences as a community organizer and civil rights activist. This ex excerpt comes from her book. Dorothy defined herself as a feminist, but rooted her feminism in her experience and in more fundamental needs for safety, food, shelter, and childcare. Dorothy entered the women's movement by way of her community and the needs of the women she encountered every day in the 60s and the 70s. Domestic violence, the welfare system, the childcare issues that profoundly affected the working class Black and Latino women who visited the West 80th Street Daycare Center and turned to the West Side Community Alliance for help became the defining issues of Dorothy's feminism. For Dorothy, the women's movement had value because it illuminated the problems that she and other women in the neighborhood faced. The result was an approach to feminism that spoke to the needs of her community, blending the community and movement organizing. Dorothy and Gloria gave talks, they traveled together. Uh, in Gloria's words, the potential of the women's movement was them. And I quote, their speaking engagements highlighted the possibility of interracial sisterhood, of being sisters under the skin, as they frequently put it. Dorothy's style was to call out the racism she saw in the white women's movement. She frequently took to the stage to articulate the way in which the white women's privilege oppressed black women, but also offered her friendship with Gloria as proof this obstacle could be overcome. In more general terms, the relationship speaks to the tensions in the early movement regarding race and the ease with which black women's experience and activism could be pushed to the margins. Although Gloria had been uncomfortable speaking in public, Dorothy was a former nightclub singer and felt comfortable on stage, and she would prove to be beneficial to Gloria. The book goes on to explain how the media launched Gloria Steinem as the single iconic spokesperson for the movement. The media pushed Dorothy's role to the periphery at the moment she sought to confront the racist tendencies mm -hmm. of the women's movement. In 2006, Tarana Burke, a sexual assault survivor, was consumed by a desire to do something about the sexual violence she saw in her community. She took out a piece of paper, wrote Me Too across the top, and laid out an action plan for a movement centered on the power of empathy between survivors. In 2017, hashtag Me Too started trending in the wake of high profile sexual abuse allegations against movie executive Harvey Weinstein. But it was erroneously credited to actress Elisa Milano. Toronto Burke had been using the hashtag since 2006 in her tireless work as an advocate for victims of sexual assault. assault. Me Too began with a focus on Black women, but soon enough it was co-opted by the mainstream and white women became its face without giving credit to its proper founder. 
Tarana Burke was quoted as saying, the white women celebrities themselves didn't co-opt it. They were survivors who came forward and told their stories. They didn't come to co-opt a movement. They didn't know I existed, not even Elisa Milano. I held no blame towards them. But there is a white woman machine in this country, make no mistake. Mainstream media took hold of Me Too, and certainly not a 40-something-year-old Black woman from the Bronx. In her TEDx talk, Me Too is a movement, not a moment. She articulates the most powerful movements are built on possibilities. Her vision is a world free of sexual violence and body autonomy as a basic human right. She speaks about the violence experienced by trans women, indigenous women, people with disabilities, and that 60% of black girls like her will experience sexual violence before they turn 18. She goes on to say that this is a movement that seeks to dismantle the building blocks of sexual violence and that power and privilege does not have to destroy and take, but should be used to serve and build. The movement, the Black Lives Matter movement came to fruition in response to the killing of mostly unarmed black people by police. It began with the killing of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman in 2012. When Zimmerman was acquitted in 2013, the movement began with a special, a social media hashtag, hashtag Black Lives Matter. This movement, a call to action where Black people are free to exist, has its roots in the labor and organizing of Black women. Although the movement does not have a centralized leadership, it was founded by three organizers, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi. There are now more than 40 BLM chapters. The Black Lives Matter movement defines itself as a Black liberation movement that creates space for women, queer, and transgender people that have been left out of the Black liberation movements. Black Lives Matter's protests have amplified the killings of Black people by police by organizing protests of the killings of Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Michael Brown, George Floyd, Abad Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor. According to the website, our goal is to support the development of new Black leaders, as well as create a network where Black people feel empowered to determine our destinies in our communities. Say Her Name is grounded in the sad reality that Black women and girls who are targeted, brutalized, and killed by police are all too often excluded from the mainstream narratives around police violence. Civil rights attorney and law professor Kimberly Crenshaw and the African American Policy Forum launched the campaign in 2014 and demanded to say her name. This campaign seeks to ensure that Black women and girls are not erased and lost in history. Stereotypes of Black women often lead to their deaths. Like Black men, they are perceived as dangerous and a threat to police. Often called for mental health reasons or help from the police, the encounters end fatally. The campaign reports that Black women and girls are disproportionately killed by police and Black girls as young as seven and Black women as old as 93 have been killed by the police. Professor Crenshaw also coined the term intersectionality in 1989 to describe how race, class, gender, and other individual characteristics intersect with one another and that many of our social justice problems are overlapping problems. The term helps to explain the oppression of Black women. This is a campaign to break silence about Black sanctioned state sanctioned violence against black women and that their lives are no less worthy of being celebrated and uplifted. The next slide is a slide of black men that 
we have heard their names in the news. And in those same years, women that were killed that we rarely hear about or know their names. Brianna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Alberta Spruell, Rakia Boyd, Chantel Davis, Shelly Free, Kayla Moore, Kim Livingston, and Mary Miriam Carey. Say her name. And I will end with this. Because this is Women's History Month, I would like to honor all the women that their names will never appear in a history book or be recognized by all that they did for the community. The women featured in this presentation for the most part were a part of national movements for change. However, let's not forget the contributions of women in communities leading in non-traditional ways. These women continue to move the needle on civil rights and social justice issues in our communities. For example, beauty shop owners. In the black community, beauty shops and barber shops are a cultural institution. Madam C.J. Walker, the first black female millionaire, showed black women how they could build financial security as entrepreneurs. Not only are they our therapists and confidants, but they are also important leaders in communities and hold political clout as they can speak out without fear of retribution or losing their livelihoods. Tiffany M. Gill discussed this in her book, Beauty Shop Politics, African-American Women's Activism in the Beauty Shop Industry. I would also like to honor our mothers, grandmothers, aunties, community church mothers, and teachers. This is personal for me because I am largely who I am because of these caring women that lifted me when the world wanted to push me down. And many of these women, they waged movements on their own, answering the call to serve their families and their communities in creative and effective ways. I benefited by this tradition as an inquisitive Black girl growing up in Southern Indiana. They were the first to teach us Black history about discrimination and gentrification when we didn't understand it or see it happening around us. I watched them take family members in that had no place to go, advocate for those in need, call out domestic violence, feed the hungry, and instill hope when situations seemed hopeless. They were also feeding our hopes and dreams and were showing us the way. I borrow the term activist mothering to describe these women. Activist mothering capitalizes on gendered skills and access and particularly as it relates to nurturing youth and the whole communities. In the book, Grassroots Warriors, Activist Mothering, Community Work in the War on Poverty by Nancy A. Naple, chronicles the voices of over 60 women, African-American, Puerto Rican, and white European American who have fought for social and economic justice in low income neighborhoods in New York City and Philadelphia. These women as community workers and activist mothers contribute vital and often unpaid services to their communities, offering complex political perspectives and empowering others. Na Naples reconceptualizes labor, mothering, and politics from the standpoint of women committed to work and politically organized on behalf of low-income urban communities. Her analysis reveals significant legacies from past social movements and examines how gender, ethnicity, and class influence political consciousness and practice. We cannot forget to hold space for this type of organizing and activism. As I conclude, women of color continue to struggle as systemic racism and sexism thwarts access to opportunities and inclusion. 
Run the World is a female empowerment song by Beyonce. And the hook in the song, who runs the world, girls, who runs the world, girls, you all know the song. And I love Beyonce, but women do not run the world. There have only been four black female CEOs of a Fortune 500 company in its 69 year history. We're experiencing a rollback of affirmative action policies, overturning 45 years of precedent, policies designed to level the playing field and the weaponization of reproductive rights. Fighting for women's rights has never been more important than in this moment. Now, although the statistics are inexcusable and the issues seem bleak, we still have hope. We will continue to celebrate the wins and push for the change because that's what we do. Women may not run the world, but it doesn't mean that we can't. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Director. Um, wow, um, well, such a powerful and uh, poignant message. I'm just gonna talk a little bit to give you some time to to breathe, catch your breath, take a uh, glass of water, what have you, and then we will open up um, the floor for any um, questions and comments. Either folks can raise their hand or um, uh, put a, com a question or comment in the uh, comment session section, but. Um, I, as you were talking, I was trying to, you know, write notes because you were saying, you know, you were dropping so many, you know, nuggets of information. Uh, but what, you know, what, what came to mind is that, um, you know, are, are black women, you know, women of color, are we invisible? You know, and and you know, studies say that yes, yes, we are. And I was thinking about, you know, just thank you so much for, you know, bringing history, you know, to to the present. Um, is to to bring information, you know, educating and, and awareness that uh, many of us, uh, you know, women of color, you know, me being an African American woman, you know, I, I sit, I look and say, do you see me? I see you. Do you see me? <laughs> you know, and and with the, you know, the 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 tragedies that that happen, you know, um, with our African American men. Um, you know, going through the, the the policing and what happened over the few years, you're you're right. The, the black women were like, well, what happened? You know, it's happened to us as, as well. Uh, you know, so thank you so much um, uh, for bringing this message. Um, thank I, you, Director Robinson, for the opportunity. And perhaps we can, um, just in the last moments that we have left, just sort of discuss. What can we do? What can we do to amplify the voices of women of color and uh, to help uh, move the needle uh, and address the issues that affect us the most? Uh, is it uh, being better allies? Uh, is it uh, finding a space to tell tell our stories, storytelling? Um, I, you know, I submit it's probably not one thing. But I think we probably have to be intentional about, uh, you know, the path forward for women of color, uh, because uh, we see that there are some really true threats uh, to women of color that are uh, with us uh, during this time. So, absolutely. And, and Dr. Warren, would you like to be the first to kind of chime in a little bit about that? I know you have your, your hand up. I do, yes. Thank you, Director Robinson. Uh, I just want to thank Diane Clements Boyd for this presentation. Of course, you see why I'm so fortunate to work every day with, with Diane uh, through our work with Iora, and she's the vice president, and we are we are we are Greek sisters from, cut from a different cloth, but we are still sisters every single day. And this was phenomenal. I love the quotes that you left there, you brought this to life for us. So there were people that I learned about I never even heard of before. And that I, you know, we, you know, I do this work, but there's so many amazing women in our path and, and working currently to amplify the voices of women. And I think for me, it's, you, we're seeing in real time so many um, of the laws that were hard fought over the years, 
like affirmative action being overturned and Roe v. Wade being overturned and uh, hard fought progress uh, that benefited women that I think it's incumbent upon all of us to keep our foot on the gas and continue to lift each other up and to continue to talk about the issues that affect women every day and to continue to support one another because if, if we go to sleep at the wheel, you can see, I don't think a lot of us ever thought for a moment that all of the progress that was made that could be gone in an instant. And so Absolutely. now we have to, now we know that it can, So we've got to work to get those gains back and work together to get that back and even to push harder uh, to, to help progress women across the world, really. So thank you, Diane, for this amazing presentation. It was fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And, um, you know, we are a sisterhood, you know, uh, so uh, we just want to join forces with uh, our, our white sisters and sisters of all backgrounds and uh, allies, our men allies. But we want you to understand our issues. We want you to see us. Uh, we have to name it and we're never going to fix it unless we name it. So, uh, you know, this is a call to action. Uh, for us to uh, uh, lift up, uh, amplify uh, our, our voices, and also uh, the issues that uh, affect us and are most threatening to our survival. Thank you. Thank you. And I am um, open the floor again for any questions or comments or any comments to Executive Director of uh, having uh, just a healthy discussion on what can we do, if you would like to chime in on that as well. And I am following the, the chat. Anyone would like to put a question in the chat or just raise your hand and speak out. I, for one, like telling the story. I believe, um, you know, there's sometimes there's only that, you know, that one story. Uh, and so the more stories uh, you, you, you tell, we would not be caught up in that single story uh, narrative um, uh, yeah, um, that's been coined over the, over the few, few years um, uh, due to that presentation is to uh, be heard. What can we do? Well, tell our stories, you know, speak, Absolutely. Speak, um, speak up and um, to be heard. And, and like you said, I love these sisters under the skin, you know, because it takes everyone, you know, um, in, in these movements. Absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions? Comments? Uh, Director, Director Robinson, I see, um, there you go, she's, a, she's on. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, Ms. Clemens Boyd, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and thank you, uh, Director Robertson, for facilitating this important lunch and learn. Um, I'm curious to know how we call out misogynoir Noir when it is perpetuated by those who consider themselves allies. Whether it's intentional or unintentional, we know that intention does not equal impact. And so when, as a Black woman, for example, we are taken for granted, um, and expected to carry up um, responsibilities that are not allocated to our own or, or just not provided opportunities uh, to advance. How do we address that without sort of burning our bridges or silencing our allies? That's, um, you know, that's a interesting question. Uh, but, you know, we, we have to be vocal. Um, you know, I think we have to take that risk. Uh, we do it with love. I think you can just about say anything to people. It's just how you say it. And I think if people really feel, um, you know, your, uh, your, your truth, really can see your truthfulness in, in uh, your positions. Uh, and uh, I think that they're open uh, to seeing things a different way. Um, I have to believe that I practice that every day. Uh, I intentionally have conversations that I know will make me uncomfortable, that will make others uncomfortable. But again, I am careful uh, to 
uh, say it in a way that I think it can be received. Um, so I, I do think that we have to take that chance of, you know, silence is consent. Uh, if we don't speak up on these issues, if we don't make our voices heard, um, well, I don't I don't know that that we can move the needle without doing that. Thank you for that response. Any other comments or questions? Yes, I hear that it takes bravery. I'm just reading some of the comments. Eye opening. Information. Again, thank you, Executive Director. You brought, you know, you brought nothing of valuable information that people just, if we're not in in this particular setting, uh, uh, would not be made aware. And that's why these type of um, lunch and learns are so very important. Uh, I'm so proud to be with the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, and that we're able to have a program uh, like this. Um, for Women's History Month and that people are attending and uh, really find these uh, looking very valuable. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and a congratulations to the PHRC uh, for having the vision uh, to do this. Thank you. Thank you. We have one, uh, Director Eister, I see that your hand is raised. Okay. I just wanted to echo um, your sentiments, uh, Director Robinson, and thank you so much for comments for this presentation. I held back um, on my comment because I was choked up. As a woman, we have challenges in common, but to hear from my coworkers and my sisters of color, I would just to hear the challenges firsthand in this, um, to take it for granted as a woman, um, not to really deeply understand all of all of this just laid out like this has really um, touched me today. And I'd really like to thank you again for your presentation um oh, thank and you. support you in and support all of you in, um and all of us in respect and um being heard and seen what director robinson said about i see you do you see me it nearly brought me to tears so um i don't really I, I really had reservations about coming on camera and being um, as emotional as I feel right now. So, but I want you to know how moving it was um, woman to woman. And I thank you all for bringing this um, <clears throat> presentation. I think it's when we show our emotion, it, it's a, a sign that we are in a safe space and, and we feel safe to show that emotion. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you um, for the presentations that we've had all month, Director Robinson, Director Brothman, um, and again, really just a, um, so so deeply um, touched to be a part of this today. I wasn't expecting to be moved so deeply. Thank you, Director Eister, and, and I concur with the, with the director. Uh, this is a safe space. And, and, you know, that's something I've always said from the time I started. So, um, you know, safe space, be safe enough, be brave enough to, um, you know, speak what's on your heart. And you you will always be okay. okay. Um, well, this concludes, unless someone has a, 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 their hands up or can't see everybody. Um, but if there's no other questions, there's no other comments. Again, thank you, Executive Director. Ms. Boyd, it's been an honor um, to, to, to hear from you, to learn from you. I'm hoping to meet you in person uh, one day. It's, it's, you know, you know, also uh, Dr. Warren meeting you in person, you know, one day. And uh, one day hope, soon, we hope. Yes, yes, <laughs> very soon. But thank you everyone for uh, attending uh, the Lunch and Learn uh, today and uh, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and be safe.